It's like he thinks that if he covers it up, it just goes away. Like if nobody sees it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, it's embarrassing. Like, I'm embarrassed for him. Do you ever think he's a little detached from reality? Thank you! For what? What? Well, he said thank you. I just was asking thank you for what? Nothing. I was just complimenting his fingernails. Okay. We weren't talking about you. <sighs> None of my business, guys. You wanna take this private? Okay, so here's what I think happened. Uh, when he got really big on YouTube, well, two things happened. First of all, he got super vain. So vain. Vain, and, and he decided that, like, since everybody sees him on a screen, that, like, that's more real than he is? Yeah, but there's not that many people that actually watch anymore. I know, and that's why, like, he, he thinks that for some reason everybody's gonna care that he's got this giant boil on it. I'm right here, guys. Excuse me, this is a private conversation. We are in the privacy tube, and you need to respect our privacy. This is an A-B conversation. See your way out of it. I can hear every word you're saying. Then stop listening! That's not how sound works! The 60s were a time of unrest in the US and around the world. There were wars, cultural upheavals, and huge advances in technology. Also, everybody rode horses. Oh, I'm talking about the 1860s. Yeah. That's right, the 1860s. Dickens was blowing up the charts in the UK, Louis Pasteur invented germophobia, and the Gatling gun made war a thousand times worse. And we did have war here in the Americas. Of course, I'm talking about the Second Franco-Mexican War, where the Mexican troops defeated French forces at the Battle of Puebla on May 5th, 1862. Cinco de Mayo. Oh, and the US was two countries for a minute there. But technologically, Elijah Gray's Otis patented the elevator safety brakes, making it possible to build taller buildings. Railroads and trains were gaining steam. See what I did there? And just a few years later, the typewriter would revolutionize the way we record and share information. But the invention of the typewriter was actually the end of a long process that began in the 1820s with an invention called the typographer. William Austin Burt invented the typographer in 1829, and he was basically trying to invent a miniature printing press, something that was smaller and faster than setting type. It kind of looked like a tiny pinball machine, like paper was rolled into a cylinder that could be rotated with a dial and a swinging lever would make impressions of upper and lowercase letters on it. It did the job, but it, uh, it was really slow and time consuming and its usefulness was pretty limited, so it never really took off. So at that point, the printing press had been around for about 400 years or so, and it did a great job of, you know, reproducing things. But if you wanted to dictate what somebody was saying, um, basically translate speech to text, that was all still paper and pen. The typographer was an attempt to solve that problem, but it was still way too slow. Um, but it did give somebody an idea. Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville was a typographer and stenographer from France, and he had a particular interest in this problem, obviously. This was what he did for a living, so like every infomercial, he said to himself, There's got to be a better way. I mean, just think of the cramps the guy got in his hand all the time. Stenographering. Ow. So one day he got a job transcribing a book on human anatomy that was called Trahit de Physiologie by F.A. Longuet. Or Longuet. I don't know how it's supposed to be said. But anyway, when he got to the part in the book that talked about how the ear works, it got him thinking. He thought if sounds were just vibrations in the air, and the eardrum captures those vibrations and then transmits them through a series of bones, could it be possible to do the same thing but then have it vibrate a stylus? And then, you know, just like the typographer machine had a paper on a cylinder that you could turn, maybe you could do that same thing and put it up against that stylus and record those vibrations on paper. So his hope was that by doing that, that maybe you could actually learn to read the squiggles that would be recorded on that paper, and that would be an actual real-time dictation of the human voice. It's kind of brilliant. So in 1853, he started working on what he called the problem of speech writing, saying, quote, Will one be able to preserve for the future generation some features of the diction of one of these eminent actors, those grand artists who die without leaving behind them the faintest trace of their genius? Four years later, he released his artificial ear dictation machine to the world, which he called the phonautograph. Not the phonograph. That comes later. He would cover a plate of glass 
Later it would become a cylinder with a very, very thin layer of lamp black, soot, basically. Above this he would affix an acoustic trumpet with a membrane the diameter of a five franc coin at its small end to emulate the eardrum. And at the center of that membrane he affixed a fine and rigid stylus and adjusted the trumpet so that the stylus would barely graze the lamp black. Then he would rotate the cylinder and speak in the vicinity of the trumpet's opening. This would cause the membrane to vibrate and the stylus to trace figures. He called the process phonautography, which is actually an apt term because what he was trying to do was sort of photograph sound. Yeah, and it worked. He had, for the first time, created a visual representation of the human voice. This work got the attention of the, Jesus help me, the Société d'Encouragement pour Industrie Nationale, or S-E-I-N, sign. I'm just, I'm just gonna call it sign from here forward. I think that's just better for all of us. Sign was basically a group of experts that evaluated new tech and its potential contributions to French industry. So Scott worked with Sign to improve his invention. Uh, this is actually when they moved from the glass plates to the rotating cylinders, and those cylinders could record for about 20 seconds. In 1859, Scott partnered with Rudolf Koenig. Uh, he was a maker of scientific instruments, but their interests eventually diverged. Koenig was more interested in the kind of the more scientific implications of transmitting sound waves. Scott was really more focused on the voice dictation thing. After that partnership ended, Scott ran out of funds to continue his research, but Koenig continued to manufacture and improve the phonautograph for a while until it eventually became obsolete. Which, of course, it eventually did. Thomas Edison would famously create something very similar to that, but it actually allowed you to play the sound back. That was, of course, the phonograph. And, uh, yeah, that was game over. Scott returned to selling prints and books and died in 1879, his accomplishment never really being fully recognized. And look, I know that the anti-Edison comments are already flying. I know we all hate Edison. He took credit for other people's work. He was a ruthless businessman and a self-promoter. But there's actually no real evidence to show that he took from Scott or ever even knew about the phone autogram. In fact, he was working on the telephone when he had a parallel idea. Uh, one of his assistants would later say, quote, We were sitting around. We'd been working on the telephone, yelling into diaphragms. And Edison turned to me and he said, If we put a needle or a pin on this diaphragm, it'll vibrate. And if we pull a strip of wax paper underneath it, it should leave marks. And then if we pull that piece of paper back, we should hear the talking. Okay, so another reason to believe that Edison didn't know about the phonautogram was that he actually thought that what he was going to record was a series of dots. He saw the human voice as a series of impulses, so apparently he was really surprised to see squiggles come out of it. So obviously he didn't know about the phonautograph because he had no idea that there would be squiggles. Also, There Will Be Squiggles is my favorite Daniel Day-Lewis film. I drink your squiggles edison's machine recorded on tinfoil in 1877 he recorded himself reciting mary had a little lamb mary had a little lamb it sprinkled with white as snow and everywhere that mary went the lamb was sure to go this was the oldest recording of the human voice in human history for 131 years Okay, so here's what happened. So while Scott's invention didn't really set the world on fire, some of his phonograph recordings did make their way to the French National Academy of Sciences, where they were just kind of, you know, kept in storage. Kind of an interesting side note in the history of sound recordings. But in 2008, a group of researchers called First Sounds tracked down Scott's recordings. Led by David Giovannani, First Sounds set out to find and archive the oldest sound recordings. And they were able to get a few of Scott's phonographs from 1860 and converted them into audible sound files. Patrick Feaster, one of the first sounds researchers, started with a phonautogram that was labeled with the French folk song Au Claire de la Lune, and then he worked with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to develop an algorithm, a visual stylus of sorts. And one of the first things that they noticed was that there was a hum underneath everything, which they couldn't figure out what it was at first. They thought maybe it was a defect in the device, but it wasn't. It was actually a tuning fork. So why did Scott mess up his recording by putting a tuning fork in the background? Well. Since he was hand cranking the device and he knew he couldn't, you know, perfectly keep it steady, he recorded a tuning fork along with it to serve as a kind of a time code. Because the tuning fork would operate at a constant frequency, so he knew that later on he could use that to kind of realign the recording. It's actually kind of genius. And that's exactly what they were able to do. They cleaned up the phonautograph in an audio editing program and manually adjusted the sound waves using the tuning fork sound to smooth out the sound fluctuations. And the sound they were able to pull from it, which they think is Scott himself singing Au Claire de la Lune, is now considered to be the oldest recording ever made of the human voice. It was recorded on April 9th, 1860, and it sounds like this.
It's rough, and there are no words, but it's definitely a song. As Patrick Feaster told Lapham's Quarterly in 2017, quote, The real moment that I knew this was going to work is when I finally got to the second different note in Auclair de la Lune. That first series of notes could just be a coincidence, but when it goes up to where it's supposed to, you know it's worked. By the way, if you don't know Auclair de la Lune, it's a French folk song that goes like this. There were other recordings from that same year that they were able to make audio out of, and the recording quality did get progressively better from there. Here's another rendition of Auclair de la Lune from April 20th of 1860. <laughs> ascending scale that he recorded on May 17th of 1860. So today, Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville is considered to be the first person to record the human voice. It just took technology 131 years to decipher it. Though it should be said that there was a French inventor named Charles Cross that saw the potential of the phonograph to actually record sound and play it back. Um, he filed this idea with the French Academy of Sciences in April 1877, just a few weeks before Edison unveiled the phonograph. In his filing describing how the machine would work, Cross said, quote, A lightweight index is fixed to the center of a figure of a vibrating membrane. It ends with a tip based on a blackened surface flame. This surface is integral with a disc driven by a double movement of rotation and linear progression. The system is reversible. When the tip makes ironing in the furrow, membrane restores the original acoustic signal. Cross called his uh, invention the paleophone, uh, and while he did file it before Edison, his machine required photographic and chemical engraving processes. Edison's didn't. Um, also, Cross didn't have the resources to make a prototype of his idea, but Edison had plenty of resources, so he beat him to the punch. Neither knew of the other's ideas, by the way. So yeah, Cross never actually got to build his device, but he did have a lot of literary friends who vouched for him in the press. Uh, and he's long been celebrated in France as the guy who beat Edison by a few weeks. Well, now France has somebody who beat him by 17 years. In fairness to Edison, though, all of that self-promotion of his did pay off because it was only after his device that sound recording really took off. In fact, Edison's tinfoil recordings really only lasted a few years before Alexander Graham Bell, his cousin Chinchester A. Bell, and Charles Sumner Tainter set out to improve the phonograph in 1880. They decided to use wax instead of tinfoil and a floating stylus instead of a rigid needle. They were awarded a patent for the machine on May 4th, 1886, and they called it the Gramophone. Emil Berliner was granted a patent in 1887 for his Gramophone that featured flat wax discs, which he chose to avoid the patents on the cylinders and also because they were cheaper to make. Oberlin Smith came up with the idea of the magnetic wire recording in 1888, but never built a working machine. But Vladimir Poulsen did in 1898 and called it the Telegraphone. Long play vinyl records came on the scene in 1948. In 1949, we see the start of magnetic tape recording, in 1964, there was a first cassette player, followed two years later by the first 8-track. The first reel-to-reel -reel deck showed up in 1972, and commercial sales of CDs began in 1982. And finally, digital audio tape was invented in 1990, and MP3 compression began in 1995. And audio recording is still progressing. Uh, one example is the i3DS developed by Novetto Systems. It uses a 3D sensing module from a speaker that locates and tracks the positions of a listener's ears. It then sends audio using ultrasonic waves that create kind of a sound pocket by the listener's ears, and that audio can be heard in stereo or 360 degrees around the listener, all without headphones. And then, this one blows my mind, there's the visual microphone. It's an algorithm developed by researchers at MIT, Microsoft, and Adobe. This just uses a camera to record the minute vibrations and objects in a room, anything from a glass of water to a plant to a bag of Cheetos. The researchers can then reconstruct the audio from those vibrations using an algorithm, basically turning that object into a visual microphone. Like, here's an example of where they recovered speech from vibrations on a potato chip bag that was filled 4.5 meters away through soundproof glass. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. That's bonkers. <laughs> that's, that's just bonkers. And it makes me a little paranoid, actually. I mean, does this mean anybody can just point a camera through my window at a plant in the room and hear everything I'm saying? Technically, yes. Technically, yikes. But I find a nice symmetry to this, you know, like it all kind of came full circle. Because the first 
sound recording technology, it was just visual representations of sound waves. And the newest technology is just recording sound waves visually. I really wonder what Edward would have thought if he ever knew that, you know, someday people would be able to actually hear these rubbings he made. Um, it certainly wasn't his goal. He was just hoping for a way to read them. I'm sure he couldn't have possibly imagined that those scribbles could be digitally imaged and fed into a computer that could translate them into sound through speakers. I mean, none of those things even existed when he did this. Either way, it speaks to how ahead of his time he was and how clever people really were back then. I think that's pretty cool. What's also pretty cool is today's sponsor, Nebula. Hey, if you think recording the human voice is interesting, well, how cool would it be to hear the very first humans to speak? Like, what would that be like? What were the first words that humans spoke and why? Well, these are questions that are posed by the amazing series Becoming Human by my friends over at Real Science, specifically their episode on how humans started speaking. They go through the archaeological record and look at how our ancestors' anatomies changed over time to determine when speaking became possible, while also considering earlier species and how their cultures and migration would have relied on some kind of advanced communication. In fact, there's an argument to be made that the first real language was possibly sign language. Like I said, that's pretty cool. And that's just one in a whole series of videos that explores the first tools, bipedalism, and how burials kind of determine the start of human culture. It's an awesome series, and you can watch it only on Nebula. Nebula is, of course, a streaming service that I'm a part of, along with many of your favorite educational creators, where we share all of our videos, that we share them ad-free, along with extended segments that we don't include on YouTube. So, for example, on this video over on Nebula, I talk about the possibility that maybe sound information might have been imprinted into the grooves of ancient pottery if you're ever curious about that. It's also where we post original exclusive videos and series. I've actually got a couple on there. There's my Mysteries of the Human Body series and my ongoing series on Forgotten Atrocities. So look, Nebula is a great way to support your favorite creators and you get tons of awesome content in return. And we're working on some really big projects right now through Nebula. So joining Nebula kind of helps us to make bigger and, and better stuff without having to you know worry about the YouTube algorithm and whatnot. And if you click on the link down in the description, you can get a year subscription to Nebula for 40% off comes out to about $250 a month, so very affordable. Oh, and I didn't even mention Nebula classes. Um, yeah, you, you can learn skills from some of your favorite creators, everything from music production to camping, and it's totally included in the price. It's really cool stuff. Anyway, it does really help support the channel and hundreds of other creators as well, so go check it out. Link's down in the description. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to keep the lights on around here, uh, forming an awesome community and just being a great soundboard for me. I really do appreciate you guys. I've got a handful of people to shout out real quick. We've got Karachan Fitzgerald, Joshua McNaughton, C. Martinez, John, and Spex. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and a Discord server with some really great people in it. There's some cool stuff happening there. Just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. Check this video out on some other sound topic. How about I put the loudest sound ever that's ever happened? I'll put that one up here. Uh, go check that out. I think it's a fun one. Um, look at any of the other videos I have my face on and the thumbnails. And if you do enjoy it, I invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. And that is it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.